The other type of tests for personality that is well known uh, and a little controversial, and I'll tell you why it's controversial, is the projective tests. The projective tests are by uh, definition ambiguous. So where in the objective tests, you have very straightforward statements. And, and those statements may be on very much like me scale to very much unlike me or very much agree to very much disagree or strongly disagree, whatever the case may be. Those are objective because the stimuli are always the same. People might interpret them slightly differently based on their vocabulary experience. But for the most part, you get the gist of each item and people then respond from looking within how they feel they best fit that item. But with projective tests, the stimulus isn't clear, it's unclear by definition. So with this ambiguous stimulus, you're supposed to interpret it or create a story about it. And in so doing, you are thought to project your personality onto it. And this is going back to Freudian psychoanalytic type of uh, psychology. Um, it asks the subjects to respond to invent intentionally vague stimuli. Uh, and the idea is that they're going to reveal their wants or their needs in the process. Um, there's some iconic things associated with this, like the Rorschach test, as we'll see. People think of psychology and they think, couch, we don't do that. That's Freudian. They think they see ink block tests. Some of us do it, but not very many anymore, and that's just not what's happening. But the biggest problem here is with reliability and validity. Because there isn't any objectivity to the stimulus, you could say anything. So how do you compare one person to another? With an objective test, you have, uh, some, you have some limitations that people could deliberately deceive the test, unless you have a very extensive um, uh, means to check that. Uh, they can respond in socially desirable ways. They can just not pay attention to it and a answer fairly randomly. But if you account for all of that, uh, it's pretty straightforward that you can have validity because the measurement standard is very clear. And so it's easy to link it in terms of correlations or predictive validity, seeing what a score on this test would predict in the real world, that there's validity to the test. With, with the projective test, however, you have this ambiguous stimuli. So there's almost no way to compare one person to another. Now, the people who develop these tests would argue the opposite. They would say, yes, there is so much data, so much rich data given from these tests that we do have the ability to standardize and norm it somewhat. Um, but with reliability and validity, there are certain processes through classical measurement theory and a thing called item response theory that we can pretty definitively show the reliability and validity of certain objective tests. It's much harder to do. Not to say that it can't be done, but it's much harder to do with projective tests. However, projective tests do provide some very rich and interesting types of data that could be useful. Um, so you know of the Rorschach, I'm sure it's the inkblot. It's the standard icon for psychology is this inkblot test uh, developed by Hermann Rorschach way long ago, I think in the 1920s. Uh, back then it was 10 ink blots. There's more of them now. Back then it was in black and white. They're in color now. But you get this blot of ink. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. By definition, it's ambiguous. It's vague. It's a random shape. It's symmetrical because you, the way you would make them is you just put some ink on a paper and you fold it up. It splats however it does. You fold it back out and that's what you got. And that's your stimulus to be interpreted. And then people are said, are, are told, the people who are taking the test are told, tell me what you see. What do you see? Well, it could be virtually anything because you're making it up as you go along. And if you answer in a, uh, a brief fashion, they will say, tell me more about that, please. They will give you standardized prompts, but not anything else. They won't suggest to you what you see. That invalidates the whole procedure. So you, you do have a little bit of standardization, at least in administration procedures in that you go through the cards in the same manner, you, uh, you present them to the person with the same instructions, and uh, the thematic apperception test, the TAT, both of those have their asterisks beside them, um, is also a well-known projected test. This is actual cards of scenes. It used to be drawings, now I think they're pictures, uh, photos, and, and uh, scenes that you see in the cards are ambiguous scenes. They can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but they're actual scenes and you're supposed to tell a story about it. And in telling a story about any one card, you don't get any kind of personality test out of that. But out of 
a story of 30 cards, you might see some themes start to emerge in those stories where some consistent type of element that might be a projection of a person's personality is coming through. With the objective test, one question does not tell you anything about somebody's personality. It is the aggregation of data across lots of questions designed to measure very specific types of things that give us some uh, confidence that we're measuring a personality construct. So for, for the test and, and for your own general knowledge, realize that the objective tests have good reliability and validity. The projective tests, that's one of their biggest challenges is demonstrating reliability and validity. And of these, uh, the Minnesota Multiphasic uh, Personality Inventory, MMPI, is your objective test icon, something to remember for your, for your test and beyond. And the Rorschach Inkblot test and the TAT, or Thematic App Perception test, is your icon for projective tests. Now, just to show you some of this, <laughs> this is an old TAT card, and what you have is a woman with a you know, objectively what you have is what appears to be a woman or a person in a dress with a hair looks like it's long done up in a bun with their head in their hand and another hand either over here on a doorknob, possibly a light switch. Uh, over here you have what appears to be a man lying in a bed and he appears to be not conscious. He could be dead. You don't know what he is. Uh, there's a window over here, a little dark space back here, gray up here, and the idea is you say to the person, tell me a story about this picture. And they would then look at it and they would make up a story. And you would take that down word by word, verbatim, and then later analyze it. That's another one of the problems with the projective test is they take a lot of time to administer. They have to be done one-on-one -on -one with a test giver and a test taker. And then you have to go through all that data and then interpret it. Whereas with the objective test, a person can usually, assuming literacy, can take it themselves. They can be scored on computer and, and uh, scores can be interpreted pretty quickly. Um, so they're a cost saver in that regard as well. Uh, but so a person might look at this and go, oh, she's killed him. She finally couldn't take it anymore. She killed him off. She got pissed. He's drunk again. He came in and, and laid out in the bed. And she finally had enough after his abuse, years of abuse. She killed him. And now she's just, she's thinking about it. How am I going to get away with this? Or how am I going to deal with the aftermath of this act? That would be a potential story you could tell. Or you could look at it and see somebody go, man, he's sick, he's been really sick, and she's terribly worried about his health. She loves this man, and she's attending to his needs, and she wants him to be better, but she's afraid he's not going to make it. And so she's, she's suffering because of her love and caring for this person. Diametrically opposed interpretations, all of which are perfectly okay. Each person would then give their own story. Again, one card wouldn't tell you anything. But if you gave 30 cards and you saw a person giving stories over and over again that had themes of substance abuse or taking verbal abuse or physical abuse or caring for somebody's health or precariousness of health and you saw that this came up again and again and again and again you might then have some basis for assuming some needs and some wants that a person may have. It will take you a lot of time to get that. That's a Rorschach inkblot, old school. It's plate four, the father card and if you look at it you'll see it's just a blot. So the person's asked to tell me what you see. And if you don't give a good answer, they say, can you tell me more? But they won't say anything else, and they may or may not respond. So you may get good data, rich data, where people are giving you really flowery and uh, verbose descriptions of what they see. Or they may get somebody who's like, I don't know, uh, armadillo, puppy, something like that. This is supposedly the father card, so you can hearken back to Freudian personality theory and remember the importance that parents played in that. So they equate father with authority figure. Uh, they say the boots are fairly conspicuous. Between them is the apparent head of a Chinese dragon or a dog. Many see this as an animal skin. After a few seconds, most can see it as a standing figure. Seen from below, common descriptors, bear, gorilla, man in a heavy coat quote unquote bad descriptions would be monster, attacking bear, I don't know why they would call those good or bad descriptions, uh, but Rorschach theorists equate your description of the figure with your perception of your father or male authority figures. For me, that is one hell of a stretch. I don't know that you can make any kind of a leap of faith like that from some ambiguous interpretation of an inkblot to how you got along or how you see or how you respond you know, with your father or authority. Uh, but that's the idea and from a Freudian point of view, that's where they're going with this. For me, I don't know, because you can just flip that thing over and what I see right there is three seahorses coming at you. So, 
if you can flip it over and come up with a totally different interpretation, it shows you, I think, an inherent weakness of the projective test genre, but people who, who are into it are very into it, and they will defend it staunchly. 